got a revelation that Jesus was the life and that the life was in him and that the life was the light. We'll talk about that. John, and I'm quoting First John, uh, John chapter one to you, but we're gonna talk about the gospel of John chapter one in just a minute. <clears throat> but except for John, and I don't know what at, point, at what point he got this revelation, <clears throat> but except for him and the apostle Paul in the New Testament, at least in, in the early years of the New Testament, <clears throat> for the first 15 chapters or so of the book of Acts, we don't see anyone else actually moving to revelation level. They were all stuck at experience level faith. Experience level faith. Turn to John chapter two, verse 23. We're gonna throw it up on the screen. I'm in New King James usually. <clears throat> Who's up there tonight? Tiffany, she's, she's the best. Not that, you know, nobody else is not that great, but she's wonderful. John chapter two, verse 23. It says this, many believed on his name when they saw the, all of the really cool things that he did. And many believed on his name. Let me quote it to you normally, the, the right way. Now when, G, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did, when he saw it, when they saw it. He heals many people. He casts out the demons and all the people that are there. He heals the paralytic and all of a sudden many and many turned towards him. They see them and they can't deny what they've seen and then they believe in him. But it's experiential faith. It's things that they've experienced. It was nothing that was revealed to them yet. That's what, in all of the Gospel of John chapter one, that's what John is explaining. He says that the word of God, the eternal word of God, the one who contains the spirit of God and is now, who inspired people to write the Old Testament and the law, he's explaining to them the light, the light that showed up in the burning bush the one, the eternal word, the capital A angel that shows up wrestling with Jacob, the eternal word. I mean, you, sometimes we explain this to people in church that Jesus like pre-existed being born in Bethlehem and they're like, what? What are you talking about? I'm like, yeah, he shows up in the Old Testament too. His, his, he just wasn't, you know, in bodily form yet, because he was preexistent. John chapter one, verse one says, in the beginning was the word, John chapter one, verse one, you can put this on there, on the screen. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So he didn't, Jesus didn't just become God when he, you know, at the point that he got baptized, there's some people that teach us that at the baptism that that's when God actually entered him, but like, you know, for the first like 30 or so years, he was just like normal human Jesus. Yeah, heathen Jesus. I don't know how you could make it 30 years without sinning if you were just, you know, not already carrying divinity. But John tells us he was there in the beginning. He was with God. Everything was, cre he created everything. And that everything that was created was made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. And then verse four, go to verse four. In him was life. This is the life that he talks about in First John a little bit later. In him was life, and the life, that life was the light. Everyone say light. Light, light. I wanna talk about that a little bit tonight. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. But he comes and, and he shows up in bodily form. If he, if, if he would have just, if he would have just given the Holy Spirit and, and, and never came, I, I don't think they ever would have believed it. Because they wouldn't know what was happening. But Jesus came and he goes, okay, I'm coming in bodily form. Look, I'm just, I'm in, I've got this body just like you, just, just like you have. And I'm gonna go show you what I want you to do when I'm gone. Are you following that? 
Jesus came and he is our model. Everyone say, Jesus is my model. In Acts chapter one, we believe, most theologians believe, and I agree with them, that Luke is the author of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter one, verse one, he's writing to this guy named Theophilus, which for like the first 15 years of my life, I thought it was a Christian bookstore down by the Galleria. Do y'all remember that one? Um, and then I found out that it was like a guy in the Bible. Uh, but he writes this letter and he says, the former letter I wrote to you, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. He began it. He didn't finish the work though. He, yes, he finished his assignment, but he began, it was everything that Jesus began to do and teach because when he left, his work isn't finished. His, his work was just finished as far as his bodily form that work was finished, but he's got to continue his work, but he needs a body, and the Holy Spirit empowers us, you and me, and the Holy Spirit is in you and me, right? Are you following me with all this? I know I'm like setting up a whole bunch of stuff to what I'm gonna share with you tonight. Longest intro ever, ever. It's all that Jesus began to do and teach. So it's our job to facilitate the life and presence of the Holy Spirit, which is the same spirit that was, was in Christ. That's the revelation that Paul got, right? And he's the only one that got it. But here's, here's the point that I'm trying to make. Everyone else was stuck at experience level faith. In John chapter 20, Thomas, it, we, we all call Thomas Doubting Thomas. And Thomas, called Didymus, one of the 12 was not with them. Y'all remember that? Jesus appears to him. Yeah, that's Thomas called Didymus, which means twin. One of the 12 was not with him. So Jesus appears to him. He's not there. They find old Tom. He was late, late to the party. Anybody know anybody in your family that's just chronically late all the time? That's Thomas. Some of you just raised your hand and you said, I are the one, <laughs> thou art the man. <laughs> Thomas isn't there. In John chapter 20, Jesus makes a special trip, and, but Thomas has these like famous dying words. Y'all remember that? Unless, turn to John chapter 20. I think it's like verse 21 or so. John chapter 20. Verse 27. Verse 21 is where Jesus shows up. Uh, verse 27 is where we're at though. Jesus makes a special trip. He walks in, the doors are locked. He shows up, scares them all to death. He has to tell them the thing. He, every time Jesus like walks in, they all like flip out a little bit. So like every time... Uh, we, we think that Jesus is like this great peaceful person. He's just trying to calm them down all the time because he startles them a lot. Peace be with you guys. Don't, you, he's like having to heal like half of them from heart attacks. No, guys, you're healed, you're healed, you're healed. I thought that was a lot funnier than y'all did, I think. <laughs> he startles them. He goes, guys, peace be with you. Quit being afraid. It's me. And they're like, okay, it's Jesus. We can like take a pill here. They calm down. He said, Thomas, you come here. Holds out his hand, and let's read it in 27. He says, reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here, put it into my side, and don't be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered to him and said, my Lord and my God. What's he saying? He's like the, one of the greatest excla uh, exclamations that he could make. He, he, he's saying, I, I believe, you're it. You're, you're not just my teacher anymore. I'm not calling you master or rabbi. You're saying, he's saying, my Lord and my God. If any of the religious leaders at that time would have been near him, they could have held him. They could have held him in contempt for blasphemy, right? Because he just exclaimed that somebody was deity, which was illegal. He's saying he believes. In verse 29, Jesus' wonderful words here, he said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. He's telling us right here, you're stuck at experience level faith. And 
he's telling him, guys, he's been telling, this, telling them this for a while. In John 14, before, in John chapter 14, this is like the, I call it the funeral chapter. Anybody know what I'm talking about? At every funeral you go to, the preacher's gonna read John 14, one through six. Right, Dad? In my Father's house, there's many mansions. The Lord's going to prepare a place for him. He's walking the streets of gold looking for his mansion. Jesus is talking to the guys. He hasn't died yet at this point. This is right after he washes their feet in John 13 and then right before he goes to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? And right before he gets arrested. But he tells them, guys, I'm going away. I'm not gonna be here much longer. And, and Thomas is the one. He's like, what, you're, what? you're going away? Can you, can you just see Jesus? <sighs> I've been telling you guys this. I'm going away. You can't go where I'm going, but it's good for you that I go away because I go to prepare a place for you. And in my father's house, there are many mansions, and if it wasn't so, I wouldn't have told you. And yeah, this is where I'm going. What do he say? And where, I go, you know. and where I'm going, you know the way. Thomas goes, whoa, whoa, hold your roll, Jesus. Slow the roll. I ain't know where you're going. And how, do I, how, do, how am I gonna get there? And, and like we, we we quote John 14, 6, like, it, it, like we're so excited about it because Jesus is like, I am the way. It's like so sacred. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And, and like we say it like so religious. And like, oh, this is so wonderful. Listen to the words of power. And I, I, I think Jesus was like saying it like with such disdain. Yeah, I think it was more like, I, I'm the way. I'm, I'm, I think he's saying it with his hands around Thomas's neck. I'm the way. <laughs> he was frustrated. You can sense the frustration in him. Maybe, maybe Jesus is a little bit nervous. Like, oh, no wonder he went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. Lord, I'm leading. That's, why do you think he's sweating drops of blood? His disciples are a bunch of knuckleheads still. Don't laugh, we are too. They were with him for three years. Some of y'all been with him for like over 30. He's like sweating drops of blood going, Lord, I, I, don't, I don't know that they're ready. In John 17, in John 18, Jesus prays two prayers. Jesus prays for himself and Jesus prays for his disciples. He knows that they're stuck at experience level faith. They, they, they'll, they'll believe anything that I show them, but when I'm going away, they're gonna have to get this through their heads that I'm still gonna be with them. But they, they don't get it. He tells them, I'm going away, you can't come with me. And it sounds kind of confusing, because then in Matthew 28, he's going, I'm going away, and lo, I'll be with you always. And he's like being taken up into the clouds, and can't you just see Thomas like standing on the ground going, you're, uh, you're leaving, how are you gonna stay with us? Right? Yeah. They, they didn't understand it. And Jesus, like, like I feel like, I, I'm not trying to like desecrate like the holiness of the gospels. But do you see the tension that, uh, of, of the disciples as they're struggling through the levels of faith? That's what I'm trying to highlight for you. They didn't, they, when Jesus left them, they weren't saints yet. Saint John, the, the good Saint Thomas, he wasn't a saint yet. They didn't, couldn't figure it out. He's going away, but he said, I just saw him disappear into the clouds, and he just said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, and I just watched him leave. That makes no sense to me. And as he's going away in the clouds, like I, I'm sure like one last booming voice, just go to Jerusalem and wait. And they obey. And even then, the Holy Spirit comes upon them and I don't think they've quite figured out 
what it is yet, but they know, they sense, they sense the presence. They can't see him anymore, but they sense the presence that, that, that was with them before it is now still with them. And, and I don't think they quite understood that it, it took Paul to explain to them that the revelation, the great mystery of the gospel, turn to Colossians chapter one, look at verse 27. I cannot hardly like have a hold a microphone in my hand or teach without quoting this or talking about this thought because it's completely changed my perspective on life completely. Is that at Christmas time every year we, we get it wrong if we're just still singing that you know he's God with us, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. God with us, he's not God with us anymore. It's Christ in me. It's, it's God in me. Colossians 1, To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is what? Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. Jesus is in you. Can you just take a moment and marinate on that for a second? Jesus, the Spirit, that's why Paul, it took Paul to get it, to teach it to everybody. And I think that John and the Apostle Paul, the only two people that I saw that got it. Here's the great thing. Can I tell you this? The, the wonderful thing that we see, the wonderful thing that we see in the disciples is that even though they may not have quite got it like the Apostle Paul did or, or John, the beloved, understood it, we see that Jesus was still manifesting himself through them and doing incredible things. At whatever level they were at, the Lord was still moving, right? Even Thomas, even Thomas, the biggest knucklehead of them, of them all, even in Mark, who became one of the authors of the second gospel of the New Testament, right? Y'all know the story of Mark? The quick version, are you ready? Mark, not a, we always think that, uh, you, you, it, this is great too, you can ask people. All right, name as many of the disciples that you can name. The first thing they'll do is they'll go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew, disciple. John, disciple. Mark, Luke, not disciples. Mark was a, a young guy that, that Paul met on one of his missionary journeys and he wants to take him along. He wants to take him along. And then he like leaves. Have y'all ever like gone on a missions trip and there's like the one person that like goes, I, I can't hack this, I'm, I'm changing my ticket, I'm flying home. That's Mark. It becomes like a big fight in the book of Acts because because Mark wants to go with them again, and Paul goes, uh-uh, I already, I already done, I've already done that once. Mark's not going with me this time, and it, it finally ends up becoming a big issue between Barnabas and Paul, to the point that Barnabas like goes, fine, if he ain't going, I'm not going either, and he's like, bye, Felicia, go, I'll take Silas, we're out of here. And they leave without Mark, but at the very, very end of the last gospel, we see Paul and we see the redemption that happens in Mark because Barnabas and Mark go out and start evangelizing the known world and they do awesome. Mark figures it out, gets maybe a revelation of faith. He grows up a little bit. It gives a little bit of hope for me and you, right? All of you that have quit on a missions trip before, there's hope for you. Those of you who've gone to church, you started out doing really, really well, and then you got completely derailed along the way, and then had to come back and basically like respond to a salvation altar call again. I know that. I, listen, I got saved every single summer at, at, at youth camp, right? I, I know I'm not the only one. I know I'm not the only knucklehead in here. 
but there was hope for us. But at the end of it, he says, hey, I long to come with you. And when you come see me here, make sh- try, to bring, try to bring Mark with you. He's like a faithful servant for Christ. He's been redeemed. They didn't get it. Here's the, here's the difference that, I, that me and my mom were talking about. This was the difference of when Paul got a revelation faith. Turn to Acts chapter nine. On the, we know the story about, about Saul of Tarsus. He's a bad motor scooter. More, more than anybody else mentioned in scripture, he, he's like persecuting, killing Christians. Like he's got a list of all of the people. He, this is, he, he's like, you know, he's, he's like the mafia of the, he's like the, the Pharisee mob. He's basically a hitman. He's got a list of Christians that he's going to knock off. And then Jesus all of a sudden appears to him. And the story, this is what I want you to see. One of the things that we say around here a lot is that life is prophesying all around you. Situations in your life are prophesying destiny over you. Learn to, learn to see that and go, Lord, I, I receive what you're, what you're doing here in my life right now. Don't claim all the bad stuff. Like when you see him doing something good, look at the details. Jesus, a lot of times, is speaking in some of the details. In Acts chapter nine, Saul of Tarsus is on, his, on the road to Damascus and a couple of things happen to him, okay? Y'all help me out with this story. I'm not gonna read it to you. We're gonna make it interactive. Saul of Tarsus on the road. You can cheat and use your Bible if you don't know the story fully. But what happens to him? What's the first thing that happens uh, to Saul of Tarsus? Gets knocked off of his, of his high place Knocks, gets knocked down to the ground. There's one. He, he goes blind. Why, why does he go blind? Okay, so the bright light happens first and the, blight, the bright light blinds him. The light shines on him. The light shines on him and he's not ready to receive it so it just like blinds him. What's the Lord saying? I, because I believe this 100%, the Lord is prophesying to him in this situation. I, Saul, I'm showing you something and I'm revealing myself to you. I am the light. I am the light that we see in John 1, 4. The light is the light of men. You've been persecuting me. It's what Jesus appears to him. And he says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's really good in the King James. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why are you persecuting me? But... It's this huge light that blinds him. And he says, you're gonna accept the light because there's gonna be no denying who it is here. And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus of Nazareth. Wait, no, I thought Jesus was glued to the seat next to the right hand of the Father. No, he's not stuck there. He can still get up and, sh- and show up on the scene. But it's a great light. The light blinds him. And he says, he tells him where to go. You're gonna go into Damascus and you're, you're either gonna accept me as the light or you're gonna be blind for the rest of your life. But I have a plan for you, buddy. But you have to have this revelation light. You've got to accept the light. And if you'll accept it, I'll give you your sight back is basically what he's saying to him. But Paul gets a revelation of the light of Christ. It's him. This is Saul of Tarsus that ends up going and even teaching the disciples in interpreting the Old Testament, Old Testament for them to understand. And he gets it. He's the first one that begins to walk in revelation faith. How do we know that? This is what I love. Go read the rest of the book of, uh, of Acts and you'll see that Paul gets in, in trouble. He gets in just a little bit of trouble. I think it's Acts 19. I might be wrong. It's, it's, it, it's in the later verses or chapters. But he goes to this town called Lystra and he gets in trouble. He does like a, a few miracles happen there and they like wanna worship him because like he's in the Roman Empire and they're polytheistic. They have a God for everything and they're like, hey, we're gonna make you, we're gonna make you a God. They, they, they bow down and worship him. And they're like, guys, no, listen, we're just men. You know, worship, worship God and they get ticked off. They're like, no, we wanted to make you God. If we can't make you God, we're gonna kill you. 
They take him outside of the city and they stone him to death. To death, he dies and they leave him for dead. And as they walk off, Paul, left for dead, they've, st listen, when you're stoning someone to death, you, you know, this is not like Monty Python. You know, it's only a flesh wound. <laughs> it, they're not doing that. Like, these guys know how to do it, right? This is like the same time uh, where, you know, the Roman Colosseum's just like a few miles down the road. They know what it looks like to kill Christians, right? They're like brutal people. They're not like, oh, that's probably good enough. He probably learned his lesson. God, you know, there's, there's not some nice old lady there going, guys, that's enough, that's enough, you know. They killed him. And then he gets up and walks off. He gets up and walks off. Why? Because he has a revelation that there's Christ in me. That's why when he writes, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he'll quicken your mortal body. And when they stone you in Lystra, you'll get up and walk off too because there's Christ in me. They couldn't touch him. They couldn't touch him because he had an appointment. I love uh, hearing, on, remember when uh, Andre Venzel came and was talking about how that, uh, that Paul had, a, he had a, 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 an, an appointment with Caesar. He had an appointment with Caesar. There was, God had destiny for him, so he, so he had to walk out his destiny. Listen, the Lord has a destiny for you, and if you'll understand that Christ is in you, then nothing can touch you. Nothing can touch you. If, you, if, you'll, if you'll get a revelation, if you'll let the light of Christ shine on you, and you've gotta contend for it, you gotta contend for it, because as I'm talking to you and telling you right now, that I'm telling you, some of you carried the devil in with you, Thank you, a few of you that laughed. Some of you carried the devil in with you. You didn't mean to. I'm not saying that you're like demon possessed or something. But you're letting him like talk in your ear going, yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know if that's right. David's just trying to make us laugh tonight. He's just trying to make us laugh, trying to, you know. He, he didn't even have anything really to tell us. He's just telling a bunch of Bible stories up there. No, I have a plan tonight. We're, we're very intentional this year talking about the series that I'm talking about. You have the revelation of faith so that you can live a life that walks in dominion. I, I, I'm here to declare over you and over your life and over your families and over your jobs and over your businesses. This is why it's good to come on Wednesday night because you'll get prophecies like this over you because I'm speaking it over you. Say, everyone say this, say he's talking to me. I'm declaring this over you. I'm declaring this over you, that your destiny in life, your portion from the Lord in life is to be envied, not pitied. Amen. You've been pitied too long. You've been pitied too long. That's, turn, I'm gonna show it to you in scripture. This is, you have the, Galatians chapter three, turn to Galatians chapter three, verse 29. <clears throat> I don't wanna turn there, it takes me too long to turn. It says that, and you are Abraham's seed. If you have Christ, if you believe, if you believe in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. That's what it says, am I right? Galatians, Galatians 3, 29, you throw that up there. You have it, mom, read it out loud. It, oh, here it is, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What was Abraham's son of promise? Who was it? Isaac, Isaac. Now turn to Genesis chapter 26, Genesis chapter 26. We see Isaac, he, he was Abraham's seed. He was the seed of promise. Isaac's the seed of promise. Look at him in verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year. I'm in verse 12, Genesis 26, 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. How many of you want a, the, an Isaac harvest this year in 2019? He sowed and in the same year reaped a hundredfold. That's the blessing of his father Abraham that's carrying over. It's rolling over. And you're an heir to that kind of blessing. Look at the next verse. The man, Isaac, began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. 
Memorize that one and read it to anyone. It says that the Bible is not a prosperity gospel. And then just drop your fake mic. And they go, well, that was Isaac. That's not for you. Just flip them back over to Galatians chapter three, verse 29, and say, no, if I believe in Christ, then I have the same blessing that Abraham's son had. And Isaac began prospering and was prosperous and became so prosperous that he was very prosperous and kept prospering. Just say prosper a lot in that verse and you'll get the gist of it, right? Look at the next one. For he had possessions. Oh, David, he's just, that's just spiritual blessings. You know, the Lord wants us to just rain down his spiritual blessings on us and we're gonna be full of the Holy Ghost, but we're gonna be dead broke the whole time. That's not what it says. David, that doesn't talk about like, you know, Deuteronomy 8.18, when it says that he teaches us how to create wealth, he's talking about like the gifts of the spirit. You're gonna be so wealthy in like words of knowledge. That's not what he's saying. You know what the Hebrew word is translated right there is wealth? Wealth. <laughs> the Lord wants to prosper you. He wants to advance you in everything. Does he, yeah. He, he wants us to advance as our soul prospers spiritual things. He wants us to be really rich in words of knowledge too and gifts of the spirit and the power of gifts and all of those things. But he also wants to advance you. How are you, how are you gonna show forth the glory of God in your life if you're like completely dead, broken, living in poverty all of the time? That's why we have the book of Proverbs to help us to understand. Listen, that's why, look, go read Proverbs chapter one. He goes, hey, Everybody, listen to this, because the Lord, like, the Lord, can you just, like, see Solomon? He's like, guys, <clears throat> I don't mean to brag, but I'm really, really, really smart. I need you to listen to what I'm saying. That's what he says in, in, in Proverbs 1. Listen, my son, listen to my words and be wise. Listen to all of it. Follow after the things that I'm gonna tell you about. It's gonna, it's gonna like, add to you. It's gonna add to you godly wisdom, and it's gonna add stuff to you. I want all of it. Why not? Back to what the, it says. And for he had possessions of flocks, possessions of herds, and a great number of servants, so that the Philistines, his, his enemies, envied him. That's your destiny. That's, that is, it is your destiny. That was supposed to be funny, too. I think Ray was the only one that laughed. He was, he's like, he didn't hear anybody else laugh though, so he goes. <laughs> it's your portion to advance. It's your portion to advance. Paul got it. He, he understood that the life of Christ was in him. John was the other one that had it. He got it. Maybe he talked to Paul, but somewhere along the, on the, along the way, he got this revelation that, that Christ was in me. When, when you read the book of John, it's not like any of the other gospels. Turn to 1 John. That's towards the back, right before Revelation. 1 John chapter one. That's what I was reading to you earlier when he's talking about the life. Read, let's read verse five. 1 John chapter one, verse five. He's, he says, we, we've heard it, we've seen it, we know it, we've touched him, we, we can't stop talking about it. And then in verse five, he says this. This is the message which we've heard from him and we declare it to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. In him is no darkness at all. One year ago, one year ago, Do you guys ever have like thoughts or, or, uh, or, or concepts that you hear preached or taught? I question everything. You can ask my mother, I've done this for a long time in my life. Is it true? Yes. They used to say of me when I was a kid, he would argue with a dead cat on the side of the road. I questioned everything. The first time, I, the first time I, I really sat and listened to someone teach like prosperity gospels that, that we could be blessed, I was ticked off. Am I the only one? I was, I was angry, no. Because I've had it taught my, uh, most of my life that you know what, you know, there, Paul, you, you, 
we like take these like one or two verses that Paul talks about. You know, I, I've learned therefore what, whatsoever state that I'm in, therefore to be content. I'm gonna be content to life. I'm just gonna be broke all the time. You know, you, you hear people going to ministry, you know, gave, gave my life to the ministry, you know, it hasn't paid anything. I've been broke all the time, been broke down, beat town. You know, they write songs about it. Sometimes I've been wounded, uh-huh, remember that one? Got battle scars to show, you don't remember this? Going through the storm, finding rain, going on in Jesus, and all, you just see like these Christians like crawling through the desert, <laughs> just barely making it, just struggling through, just gave my life to the ministry, should have given your life to Jesus, and not, maybe not to the ministry. That's what it was taught to me. And I hear, I hear this thought that, that sickness, you know, that we can, that anyone could be healed and that we should walk free. The first time I heard Bishop Oyedepo preach a message called Enough is Enough, it changed my life. It made me mad first though. I heard it and I'm like, that, that's not right. That's not scripture. And I've never seen anybody, I, I love listening to preachers. I love listening to the word of God being preached, taught, I love it. Love it. I've never heard a preacher quote scripture like Bishop Oyedepo. He, he, he preaches for an hour. I, I've, never, I've never seen him take a Bible to the pulpit. I, he, he, he quotes it. He literally walks around. He's got like one of the lapel mics and he walks around his whole church like preaching the message like, like whipping them off like they're nothing. Am I wrong? How many of you have heard D David Oyedepo preach or saw him before? I encourage you, watch him on YouTube. Watch the message, only, one, only watch one of them though, okay? Only watch one message. <laughs> we'll watch the rest of them for you. Watch as many as you want, it's powerful. YouTube, David Oyedepo, enough is enough. He talks like that, and it is so powerful. Watched him rattle off scripture after scripture, talking about how that Christ has redeemed us, and that, that we've gotta, it's, it's where, I went to the school of David Oyedepo to learn what violent faith looked like. I, I could listen to his stories all day long. I drive around in my truck and listen to him tell stories about women that are, are healed, complete, like 100% hysterectomies, but still want children and have the audacity to go to the man of God and ask him for him to pray. And he looks at him and he says, he says to, to the woman and her husband that's standing with them, do you want a boy or a girl? And she says, well, I want a girl, but he wants a boy. He says, you'll have both, like violently. <laughs> violently, mark the calendar. Write it down, nine months from now. And then they show back up at church nine months later holding a boy and a girl that the doctors can't explain when they, when they go and do a cesarean because the, the woman's like in her 50s and has twins. And when they do the cesarean, the doctor pulls them out and goes, I, I don't understand. There's no uterus but two healthy babies. How many of you, okay, maybe not all of the men, how many of all of the women know that's completely 100% impossible? Because why? Because Jesus is not bound. He's not bound by a uterus that he already created anyway. He's not bound. It's the foolish things of the world that he comes to confound all of the wise people. That he said, you know what? If I don't do it this way, they'll say, oh, you know, you know, it was just coincidence. That's not coincidence. That's not coincidence. Tell whoever it is to watch that testimony. You know what I'm talking about. Get drunk on that. Some of you are like upset. I can't believe you just said drunk. Go read the book of Jeremiah. 
It says, Lord, we are intoxicated with your word. Get drunk on the wine of God's word. When you hear the testimonies, I'm, I'm telling you, it'll mess you up. Listening to the testimonies that are verified. And you, and you see the, the, the stories. You see the ba- you can't argue with the babies <laughs> and, and, and the mother's tears. You can't argue with the woman that looks like grandma holding two babies. But this was the thing that I didn't understand. I, didn't, I, I knew that God was good, but I didn't think that he, that he would redeem us completely from all sickness. This is what I thought. This is what we were talking about today. This is what, what I thought, that Christ has come into the world and he, he, he's here to like be like our helper. He's gonna help her. Anytime we, we like go through things in life, he didn't say it would be easy. This is what I used to say. The Lord never, you've heard it too. The Lord never promised us that it would be easy. He said that he'd be with us. And then, all, then we all cry together. <laughs> I'm gonna make it because he's with me. But it's gonna be awful, but he's with me. That's what we tell each other. And that's not what he said. I'm here to tell you tonight that he didn't just promise you that he would be with you when it got tough. I'm here to tell you that he said, he came to tell you that he would redeem you from all of the curse of the law. That means that everything, everything that came into the world because because Satan deceived Adam, anything that came along with it, he redeemed you from, And I'm declaring to you the gospel that is from front to back declares that you can return to the state. Dad, you said something yesterday and commented on the the broadcast that was incredible. I'm here to declare to you today that if you will let the light of Jesus Christ shine in in your life and you will begin to contend for a revelation of faith that, that, that doesn't stop at knowledge level, that just knows what God's word says, but you, you start digging in and saying, Lord, you said that when your word comes in me, that I'll be blessed in the city, in the country, when I go in, when I go out. You're not just gonna set me high above, you're not just gonna set me high uh, above my family, you're gonna set me high above nations, high above nations. I'll be blessed, I'll be blessed. Everything that I do, whatever I do will prosper. That's what I declare over you in 19. There's no, you know what, I'm just going, I just just having a, a down season. No, he's not redeemed you so that you can have down seasons. The light of the righteous shines brighter and brighter and brighter. Not, you're gonna shine bright, but then we're gonna have to recharge your batteries a little bit. No, if you'll stay plugged in, if you'll stay plugged into the word, it only gets, it, 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 it's no faith, no faith. And then, and then it goes, okay, little faith. Little faith, some faith, great faith. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 12. He says, having then gifts differing one from another, whatever you're gonna do, go do it with all diligence. Right before that, I think in verse three, it's a, he makes a statement, according to each one that has, according to how each one has been dealt, a measure of faith. Don't get stuck at, at, at a small measure of faith. But if, if you'll keep digging in and get, keep digging in and get intoxicated on God's word and start walking away, and this is the, this is the verse that I found, 1 John chapter 1, verse five, because I was struggling with it. I don't know. I don't know if the Lord, I, I still wasn't convinced that sometimes Jesus didn't let us get sick you know, this is, these are, this is the real religious thing that people say. You know, I know the Lord didn't do it to him, but he allowed it intentionally so he could teach them a lesson. Where do you see that in scripture? Who do you see that Jesus walked up to and said, I'm, you know what? You know, I'm not gonna heal you. I'm gonna let you get sick this time, but I'm gonna teach you some good lessons next week. He didn't do that. And we, Acts 10, 38, and we know how Jesus of Nazareth went about doing good and he healed them all. He healed them all. He healed them all. And I kept struggling with that. Well, I know that he didn't cause it, but, but maybe he allowed it. But if he allowed it, then that means that there would have to be some measure of darkness in him, right? We have this idea that God throws out a little bit of darkness so that he can pour out a lot of bit of light, right? 
That's not what he says. Look at this. I'm gonna read it to you, and I want you to get intoxicated on this one. This is the message which we have heard. This is Jesus' BFF right here, right? That's why they call him John the Beloved. He's the one that John always refers to him in his gospel as the one that Jesus loved. They're sitting at the table. There was only one that was sitting really close to him that he was close enough to put his head on Jesus' chest. They were close. They were good friends. He knew him well, and this is what he says. This is the message which, I, which we've heard from him, and I declare to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. There's no darkness. That means that anything in your life that's causing you pain or struggle comes from one place, the fiery pits of hell. John chapter 10, verse 10, same guy writes the words of Jesus, and he says that it is the thief that comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Anything that's causing darkness in your life, write that down, circle it, memorize it. Anything that is causing darkness in your life is coming straight from the enemy who wants to kill, steal, and destroy you. And if you get stuck at knowledge level word, you'll read this but, and you'll believe it to be true but won't believe it for you. Revelation faith decides that the word of God is true for me. Say that, say the word of God is true for me. We sang the song tonight. Greg's still in here. What's the word, Zayden? Something about, something. you made a way where there seems to be no way or something like that. Because I believe you'll do it again. He'll do it again. We believe that he can do it. We believe that he's able we believe that God can do anything, but we're not quite convinced that he's done much yet. Right? That's kind of where we've been stuck. Let's, let's get past that. Dad, what's the thing that, that you said yesterday? We're talking about getting to the place in life where we, where we rise above and, and, and lay hold of the, the healing. Some of you are here tonight, and you've been struggling with the same thing. The, the doubt of, I know that God's able, but I'm just waiting for him, I'm just waiting for him. And I said something that offended some people on the broadcast yesterday, which y'all know, if I ever offend somebody, you know, I get really sad. <laughs> Jesus gave me the gift of the honey badger. And y'all know the honey badger, right? <laughs> what does the honey badger do? Nobody knows what the honey badger does? Y'all know what the honey badger does? What? Honey badger don't care. <laughs> That's it. I, this is the statement I made, though. I said that hope is an enemy of faith. David, no, you can't say that because these three remain, faith, hope, and love. If you get stuck at hope level, don't get stuck at hope. Some of you are hoping. This is, these are the things. I, I'll walk up to people, and I, I'm telling you, we declare bold faith over people. The Lord's gonna heal you. You, you have to be healed. I was talking to somebody before church, going, it can't stay. It can't stay. The thing you're telling me in your life, it's not allowed to stay. It ha your body, your physical body has to line up with the, with the word of God. It can't stay. It can't stay. We, we, we like declare bold faith over them. And I, I'll hear this oftentimes. I didn't hear this tonight, and I was glad for it. I heard, yeah, I, yes, I believe that. I accept it. That's what I want to hear. This is what we hear a lot. Man, I hope you're right. Man, I hope you're right. No, you remain the same. You remain the same. You remain the same. If you, if you have the belief that I, I hope that the Lord will do it. When I was a children's pastor, we would do, we would do prayer requests. We would take prayer requests sometimes. It, it's, that's one of the funnest times of children's church, by the way. You know you're in trouble when the, the, one of the kids, raise, when you have a seven-year-old raise their hand, you're going, okay, does anybody have anything we can pray for? And a seven-year-old raises their hand and goes, um, if they start it with um, you're in trouble. If they start it with um, one time, then you're in real big trouble. Um, one time, I was riding my bike, and there was a dog, and then we were going around a tree, and it's called, what's the problem? And I'm like, just get to the point. Amy will tell you, I'm like a bottom line guy. I don't wanna hear the story. Just tell me what, what's wrong. What am I praying for? I don't want you to have the backstory. I don't wanna hear the backstory. They would say things like this. I just hope that Jesus would heal my grandmother. He won't, he, if you're just hoping, he won't do it. I know what you, 
those people are laughing are thinking to themselves, man, he was like a really bad children's pastor. <laughs> I didn't tell them that. I would just help them go, hey guys, we're not here to hope, we're here to pray in faith. So when we say our prayer requests, we're not saying we hope Jesus will. We're saying, hey, guys, I wanna pray together because we're gonna pray this, we're gonna have a testimony that God's gonna heal my grandmother. I believe it, will y'all pray with me? And then they're like, yeah. But we need to learn to pray that way. Quit saying prayers like, Lord, I just hope that, you're, I hope that you'll hear my prayer. That's one of my pet peeves too, when you hear people praying like prayerless faiths or, or, or faithless, <laughs> prayerless faiths. <laughs> faithless prayers. The thing that, that he said though, come here, read that to him. Come tell it to him. Only read that to them. If you tell it to him, you'll preach. And I only have zero minutes left. <laughs> Jesus did not take straps on his back so we could be healed when we get to heaven. You would have been healed when you get to heaven anyway. He didn't come here and take stripes on his, on, on his back so that you could get healed in. I just know when we get to heaven, I'll finally receive my final healing. That's the most ridiculous teaching in the world. Why would Jesus come and take stripes on his back? I think that's a reproach against him to say something as ridiculous as that when we get to heaven, we'll receive our final healing. No, let's, let's lay hold of it now. He paid for it so that we could have it now. Yes. Yes. He paid yes. for it so you could have it now. Amen. But it's gonna take revelation faith. It's only gonna come, how does it come? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing Hearing the word of God. You have got to be addicted to word revelation. Be addicted to Bible faith teaching. If you hear somebody that's teaching, that's not faith, Bible teaching, there's some really good concepts out there that sound really, 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 really good and happy. It'll make you feel really good to have no revelation faith in them. Listen to surround yourself with faith people, yes. with Bible faith people. If you're, like, if you're sitting there going, David, I don't know, I, 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 don't, I don't know where to even get that. Listen, even no matter how much you don't like me, <laughs> listen to our broadcast. I'm telling you, I, we are pounding faith. We are pounding the word of God exactly as it reads not twisting it or taking it out of context. This is what happened, to, I told you what happened to Paul. They tried to kill him in Lystra and couldn't. Same thing happened to John. They arrest him. They say, we're tired of hearing you. John, John the beloved, we've heard about you. It was you that got arrested like the first week, on, like right after the day of Pentecost, you got arrested. And didn't we tell you to quit talking about this Jesus? What, what was their testimony? You decide for yourselves, read it, Acts chapter three and four. You decide for yourselves whether it's right or wrong for us to be preaching it, whatever you think. But we will not stop talking about the things that we've seen or the things that we've heard. We will never stop. We will never stop talking about what we've seen. Bold, like faith like a lion. Faith like a lion, the lion of Judah, the life in him. They tried to kill him, they tried to boil him in, in hot oil, submerse him in the oil and bring him back out and, and what's happening? Nothing happens to him. What? They couldn't kill him and they couldn't kill him. And the wicked one, if, if you live a life of righteousness, he writes this, the one who lives a righteous life, the wicked one cannot touch him. Read it in 1 John 5. Let me find it for you so you can know which one it is. Turn to 1 John chapter five, look at verse 18, 518. 1 John 518. David, I just don't know if that's right to say that you know the devil can't even touch you. you know, that sounds like some type of MC Hammer rap song. 1 John 5, 18, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. 
If you're born of God, you're gonna, you'll, you'll walk away from doing dumb stuff in your life. So if you're sinning, quit it. Live a life of holiness because it's worth it. Not so that you can be super religious and tell everybody how good you are, so that you can walk in the blessing and the favor of the Lord. Do what's right, isn't that good? Holiness teaching for the right, for the right reasons, right? So that you can have this. But he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. The wicked one, who's the wicked one? That's the enemy, Satan, does not touch him. I'm here to declare to you today that if you'll do what's right in the eyes of the Lord and live by the book and get the word deep down in you, have a revelation from God's word that every, stand with me, and I'm gonna prophesy it over you. As you walk in righteousness and the truth of God's word and let the word become seed, Luke 8, 11 says that the seed is the word of God. Jesus tells the story about the sower that went out to sow the seed and he explains it in Luke 8, 11. He says the seed's the word of God. When you plant the seed, the word seed in your life, it's gonna produce a harvest in your life and if you'll combine that with doing what's right and walking away from dumb stuff in your life and live a life of holiness and righteousness, you will live a life that walks high above. You'll be seated with him in heavenly places and the wicked one will never touch you. Sickness falls off your life today in Jesus' name. It has to, it has to bow because you're above it. If you receive that, lift your hands to the Lord, I'm gonna pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that the wicked one cannot exact upon us. We thank you for that. Lord, give us strength today. Strengthen our spirits to walk above reproach, to live a life of, of godliness and holiness. Lord, teach us to do what's right, even when it's not easy. And Lord, I thank you that as we do that, we're obedient to your word, that we're gonna walk away from sickness, disease. We're gonna walk away from struggle. Lord, we thank you that your favor is upon the people tonight. We bless them today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, if you receive his favor tonight, to walk above and not beneath, say, that's me. that's me, in Jesus' name. All right, we love you. All right, we'll see you on Sunday, and that's all we got for you tonight. Watch the broadcast tomorrow, 10 a.m.